So yes, you can battle through meditation if you want to do it that way, if you don't want to do the preparatory sort of work, which I do recommend taking notes for so you can like have it on point every time, right in your back pocket, ready to go. Um, but it's going to be difficult. You have to be willing to put up with that and you have to be willing to put up with the challenge of saying, okay, um, I'm ready to not be peaceful for a while. I'm actually ready to take on these challenges, physical discomfort, mental discomfort. I'm ready to take these on to develop insight. We're going to develop insight right now as a way to eventually settle down. And I'm on board with that. And I want to conquer these challenges. I want to change them, transform them into wisdom. All right. So you can do it that way. I've done it that way as well for like my Zen center meditations. I'll have like a big dinner before and it sucks trying to meditate. But it's just like, I know that. I know that's going to happen. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be an insight meditation. <laughs> I'm already ready for that. And um, it's fun, actually. Well, kind of. <laughs> it would be nice to feel good as well. Um, no, but I like that means anyway, actually. A great way for me personally to settle down into meditation is cultivating, mm, guiding the mind along different avenues of wisdom but firsthand beforehand as a means to quiet it down, to get it to settle down and eventually settle onto what I want my real meditation to be, which is along the lines of Zen, Soto Zen. You're following, so I follow the breath. I try to make sure that the prana currents are united throughout the body. And I try to make sure that the mind is deconceptualized, meaning all of the sensory that I'm hearing, I make sure that I'm not making stories out of it being like, oh, that's a bug buzzing. Oh, that's a person shifting in their seat. If your mind is still perceiving that way, it's con in conceptualization and that's not in line with truth. In line with truth means everything's the deathless. It's without meaning. It's all just transformations of, of the one, right? So all sensation is actually meaningless. And that's kind of the frame you want to shift into for Zazen. Um, you're f shifting into the non-dual frame where you're just observing. Pure observation. Without personal self. Without meaning. Without personal self. And you want to dwell there. You want to abandon this personal self such that there is a joy within you. That, that will be the natural reaction once you succeed at that. Abandon personal self. Observe without meaning. This is an you know, alignment with the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha's original teachings. And you want to observe the breath, observe it with regard to the full body all at the same time. That is my method of Zazen at the moment. And, um, you know, there's some frills too. There's a lot of cool, like, diversions that I move into. And actually my process for evaluating phenomena to settle down into that non-dual state is... Very exciting. It's very interesting and, and exciting. And um, it would benefit a lot of people to, to, to learn about that. So, but that's the basic overview, the basic template for the actual meditation part. And um, no, but I've, the, the main point was that I do recommend a preparatory meditation beforehand where you're, you're contemplating really. Do a walking meditation to keep your mind from wandering really. And um, feel it, to feel unrestricted and to keep it from wandering. Reflect on all of your motivations. Reflect on the reasons why you want to pursue samadhi. Whether that's to escape rebirth, whether that's to... Just because you, you're excited about the idea of having a joy that's separate from worldly acquisition. Maybe it's the prestige of it. You're like, yeah, I want to be that, that monk guru guy. And this is the way to do it. Just from a genuine place. Like we got to stop denigrating ego in this modern age. Like there's a difference between excitement and narcissism. That's what we need to learn in this modern age. And that's why people, well, that's what's holding back modern spirituality, the development of modern spirituality. We have this whole new world that we're living in and we're still, we're still operating from the paradigm of the recluse guru who has nothing. He wears a diaper. <laughs> Just kidding, sorry, that's kind of irreverent. He, we he wears like a loincloth, let's say, a loincloth. And like, he, he wants nothing from the world. Okay, that's our paradigm that we think it has to match if you're a godlike person. Actually, you can do anything because you're God, right? 
If you become God, become your God self, you can do whatever you want. The question is, are you doing it from a place of integrity and a place of authenticity? You can still have all those things and not be attached to them. Surprise, surprise. That's the whole point of real non-attachment. Can you have them and still not be attached to them? If you can't, you're not a real guru. So just imagine your favorite guru being bedecked with everything that you want in the material world. And uh, if you can't imagine them still being a guru, then that's on you. That's on your perception, on your preconception of what makes a godlike being. Yeah, it's easier to see if you blatantly show that you want nothing from the world. But is that effective as a teaching method? No, it's not. It's only effective for the few renunciates. If you want to teach the whole world, you've got to appeal to each person. You've got to show them that the spiritual life isn't limited to a shoebox. It's not limited to a cave. It can manifest with everything you currently have. That's the whole point of a householder yogi. Like, if you actually did read the spiritual scriptures, you'd know that householder yogis attain enlightenment. You can have a wife and kids. You can have a fucking job and still attain enlightenment. You can have everything you want. You don't have to wear a diaper, guys. Be sure Is it easier? Probably. Is it easier as a renunciate? I think so. But you have to train for that. You don't just hop into renunciation. You've got to have a solid foundation of swadhyaya, spiritual study. You've got to have a solid foundation of self-work, yama and niyama. That's when renunciation becomes effective, efficacious, let's say. If you don't, then it's like you're trying to start bench pressing at 200 pounds as like a weak little 120 pound kid. You're like, oh, that renunciation thing sounds sweet. Let's hit the 200 pound barbell. And then what happens? You eat shit. And you don't really evolve as quickly as you could if you followed a more integrated, balanced path forward, building up to that new phase of the spiritual life. All right? Whether or not you take it on, it's up to you. See, this is the new paradigm for spiritual spirituality. It has to be more integrated. It has to include modern conditions. Different, totally different scenario, guys. This is not... 2000 BC India anymore. There's new conditions to work with. There's new tools to work with. And the modern human is actually much different than back then. So these are all factors to take into account. These are things that I am aware of from my own path. I've gone through all this. That's why I know all this. And that's why I can help you figure it all out for yourself. That's kind of my goal. I want to change this paradigm. We got to figure out a spiritual path that works for you. It could be the old world way, it could be a new world way that incorporates manifestation and like the joy of life. But um, you know, that's up to you to figure out on your own personal journey. So I just talked for straight up eight minutes to my phone and I didn't even plan to do that. So um, yeah, I will leave you with that. I don't think I'm gonna post this because I started with <laughs> no premise. I just hopped into something I was already thinking about. But um, yeah, maybe I'll throw this on YouTube. Let's see, peace.